And the democratization of data is not only about access, but it's how, about how to make data usable and understandable to everybody the data matters to. And so we have folks saying, like Sandy from Arizona, too many people are afraid of the data for us to even get involved in the conversation. So that's something we have to acknowledge. Next, data has typically been used for three reasons in education, for research, for accountability, and for improvement. And now if you want to talk about trigger words and things that have become toxic, it's the idea of accountability. Educators are afraid of accountability. They don't want to take chances. They don't want to try something and fail because they are afraid they will be punished. We cannot grow in an environment where we're afraid to try something new, okay? So it's very important that we begin to tease out that data for improvement is to grow our learning and our understanding of what's happening, whereas data for accountability is what comes with sanctions. And the only way you're gonna get folks past this is to show them. The proof is gonna be kind of in the pudding, so to speak. They're not gonna believe that the data is not gonna hurt them until they see that the data doesn't hurt them. And so here we have someone else who responded um, to the survey talking about the tension between using data for improvement in their own organization. And then last but not least, we have mental models about how we interpret student data. Now there are four common mental models about how we interpret achievement data. First one is that we see achievement data as a result of instruction. Good instruction leads to high achievement. Other folks see achievement data as a result of student understanding. Others see the data as a result of how the test was designed. And then the fourth model, which is the one we have to be most concerned about, is when folks see the data as either proof or evidence of deficiencies within the students. If you are gonna engage in data work, you have to figure out where the folks in the room are because everyone's looking at the same data, but interpreting it in different ways. And that's where storytelling becomes important because we have to make what's happening in our heads explicit so we can all get on the same page. Now you might be saying, what am I supposed to do with all of that information? You're supposed to prepare those, for those initial meetings by recognizing what people are already bringing to the table. Recognize the truth about analytic violence and about accountability versus improvement. Allay people's fears as they come in the room. Second, build in time. And I know for those who responded to the survey, time was the biggest barrier. And here I am telling you to build in some more time. But, Build in time for building capacity around data literacy, okay? Everything doesn't require logistic regression. Some things, a line chart is sufficient, and everyone can understand that. And last but not least, always anticipate the deficit ideas that may be coming up when you get together to discuss data and have in your back pocket things you can use to address it in the moment. Don't address it later, don't address it on the side, because even if only one person has verbalized this deficit idea, other folks in the room have it, and it needs to be addressed. Okay, so thank you to everyone who did the little feedback of, from the video I sent earlier. Um, and I do recognize that for half the time, one of the questions was missing a word. That shows you that things don't have to be perfect for you to use them to collect data. Um, but I wanted to show you the type of data you said is most readily available. So these are the types of data that 
uh, more than 50% of the respondents said was readily available to them. Attendance data, discipline data, grades, and summative assessment data. The other type of data that was readily available was demographic data. And so my question is, what kinds of stories can we tell about this data? So when it comes to attendance data, are we talking about opportunities to learn? Or sometimes is that data representative of opportunities to experience spirit murdering? Maybe it's better if little Johnny stays home if the school is a toxic environment. What does discipline data tell you? Does it tell you about students misbehaving? Or does it tell you that maybe there's cultural mismatch between teachers and students? Because we know that appropriate behavior is culturally defined. What is that data telling you? Is the data on grades telling us what students know? Or is it telling us more about their behavior and how much they comply? Is the data on summative assessments telling us what students know or about instruction? Or might it be telling us how much money a family has or about a student's test taking skills? This data that is readily available sometimes doesn't tell us all of what we need. So Leslie from Trinity Basin Prep said it tells us a limited story about who we serve. And then Danielle Blue from CPS says it tells us who the system is working for and who it isn't. But what it doesn't tell us is what to do. And this is the data that's most available. Data for data sake is not useful. And I say that as a data person. It's not. Data are only as useful as the conversations they evoke and the sense making they catalyze. Essentially, data isn't useful until data leads to action. And so what kinds of data do we need? 